Thank you so much. Um, so we have a last speaker uh, during this session, and we would like to hear. Um, we, we've heard already uh, how important the flavorings in electronic cigarettes are, and we would like to hear from our next speaker, the, the, uh, Paul Weiss, uh, who is associate member in Mono Chemical Senses Center, and he has a broad interest in the human chemosensory perception, including taste, smell, and flavor. Thank you. Right. So, yeah, I, I study basically human response. Um, so, if people ask what I do, I, I have people sniff stinky things, taste awful stuff, and and blow noxious vapors into sensitive mucous membranes, and I get paid for that. Um, so, it's 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 pretty fun. Uh, so, I've done a little bit of research relevant. So, flavorings. I mean, basically, flavorings make stuff taste good. So, it can accentuate or add a positive sensation. It can ameliorate a negative sensation to increase palatability and facilitate product use. So obviously if you want kids to eat more vegetables or if you want them to take their prescribed medications, that's great. Uh, on the other hand, if it would encourage people that otherwise wouldn't use nicotine to experiment with ends, uh, not necessarily good. And I'm not going to take any kind of stand on the percentages we heard that that may not be a high percentage. Um, uh, so on the other hand, of course, if it encourages smokers to quit, I mean, if ENDS are shown to be a lower harm product uh, or, and or an effective quitting device uh, or quitting cessation aid, uh, then obviously they could, be, they could be quite beneficial. All right, so I'm not taking any stands on that. That's all framing. Um, I'm going to talk really, I'm a sensory guy, so I'm going to talk about sensory effects of, of, of ENDS uh, and flavor modification. So overview, I'm going to talk a little bit about qualitative research and survey research. You've heard plenty of that already, so I'll go through it quick. Um, I'm going to talk about an interesting recent study on reward value, a uh, laboratory study. Uh, talk a little bit about the underlying sensory systems, what we know to be in ENDS and what we expect they would do to sensory systems. Uh, some recent sensory studies on ENDS, and I can talk about this in a little detail because there really aren't that many. Um, so I bet there's a great deal of research in some private laboratories that's not published, but as far as published, um, not a great deal. Um, and finally, I'm going to talk about some key methodological considerations in evaluating sensory studies and maybe a few areas where you'll see it, my, my personal interest uh, uh, a little bit, you know, because it's tainted to the sensory uh, analysis aspects, but uh, things that might need some further work. Okay, so one thing to do is just look at what users are saying about vaping. Uh, there's a large online presence of, of vapors describing flavor as, if not the most uh, discussed topic in vaping forums, certainly one of the most. Um, some people are starting to mine, uh, say, Reddit and Twitter to gain some insights into product categories and how, how they might differ for use. I find it quite interesting just to look at what some people are saying. So you have one user saying that, uh, that their favorite e-juice is, is reminding them of a, of, a, of a favorite dining experience and maybe even a more positive favorite social experience. Um, you have another person saying that candy flavors are a reason they were able to quit smoking. So you see these themes uh, again and again. And survey research, sorry for the big block of text. I wanted to get some examples out there with references. Uh, but, you know, my, my, my interested layman's gestalt is that, yes, there are probably some differences amongst groups and, and what they use and how they use them. But as a kind of bottom line, you know, these candy, uh, uh, fruit, and other interesting flavors are popular with everybody, young and old, smokers and non-smokers, and cited as important reasons for use. So based on what people say about the products they use, uh, it sure seems that flavors are important. So what if we take it into the laboratory? Uh, this is by a group that's right across the street from us at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, so they took smokers, young smokers who do not use ENDS, uh, deprived them of nicotine for 12 hours, and then they bring them in and they give them e-cigarettes that are either unflavored, green apple, uh, or chocolate. And so one thing is just a subjective rating, how, how well, I mean, how likely are you rate that it's satisfying and how you know, strongly does you say that it tastes good? simple one to Southern Likert scale, um, both of those scores are higher for the flavor than the unflavored product. Um, so absolute reinforcing value, you just let people go for 90 minutes and let them vape and they can choose one or more cigarettes. And they'll take twice as many puffs of, of the flavored versus the unflavored cigarettes. So they can, in some sense, put their money where their mouth is um, in terms of behavior. One thing I thought was very interesting, um, relative reinforcing value. So you ask subjects to do a fairly obnoxious task of hitting a target with a mouse repeatedly. And if you 
get enough clicks, you get rewarded with a puff. And people will click this mouse 10 times as much for a flavored puff as an unflavored puff, even though they can get their nicotine just as well from the unflavored device. So clearly for these smokers that are nicotine deprived, there's reward value here that's over and above just the drug. Um, so would that play out the same for non-smokers? Would that play out the same for smokers who are not nicotine deprived? Unknown, uh, but at least it's, it's an interesting area for further research, I think. Okay, so going on to specific sensory effects, we refer to flavor and taste as a general thing, but I'm a chemosensory geek, so I like to drill down on what the individual sensory systems are involved and what the, the compounds are doing. Okay, so when people say taste uh, in common language, they're really referring to the whole experience. Um, chemosensory types, when we say taste, we mean very specific sensations, sweet, sour, salty, bitty, sa bitter, savory, maybe a few others, uh, that r arise from stimulation of specialized receptors in the mouth, mostly in the tongue. Um, so propylene glycol is sweet. Vegetable glycerin is sweet. Uh, the vegetable glycerin more than the, the, the propylene glycol. Um, also, a lot of at least do-it-yourself users are putting sucralose in this, a chlorinated sucrose molecule that's undigestible. You may recognize it as a key ingredient in Splenda. Um, just an aside, there are taste receptors in the airways. They are involved in mucociliary clearance. They're involved in uh, immune response. They're involved in smooth mu muscle function. Most of that has been done in bitter receptors, but there are sweet receptor subcomponents expressed in the, in the nasal tissue. Completely unknown what those are doing. So people are puffing these bioactive molecules. No evidence to, to judge what that's doing. Don't know how often um, the, the retail people put sucralose in their, in their juice, but um, probably, I, I would guess at least some. Um, other compounds, so nicotine is bitter, menthol is bitter. Uh, propylene glycol might have a bitter side kicker as well as sweetness. So sweetness is desirable in its own right, but it also strongly, robustly masks bitterness. So you have both bitter targets and that could be masked and, and the, the wherewithal to do it. Olfaction results when mostly volatile flavor molecules reach specialized receptors high in the nasal cavity. Can get there through sniffing, can get there through a backdoor route through the oral cavity nasal pharynx. The backdoor route is much more important in flavor generally. Um, so what kinds of compounds are, are responsible, are primarily acting through smell? Probably, you know, most of them. Um, so there's a recent, you know, up until recently we didn't have a lot of good information, and I guess we still don't, about what's in most juice. But a recent paper that came out in 2016 analyzed 30 juices, and the, the, list of, the list of characters are very common to anybody that does, very familiar to anybody that does flavor research. You know, some aldehydes like uh, uh, vanillin and ethyl vanillin, key components of vanilla flavor, uh, some fruity esters like ethyl butyrate um, and uh, ethyl acetate, uh, and some alcohols like ethyl maltol and uh, maltol, which are kind of a malty caramel type of flavor. I mean, ubiquitous, ubiquitous in foods, beverages, and various other things. Okay, so although those things are often called sweet, if you pinch your nose, if anything, that probably it's tasteless, and if anything, they'll be, they'll be slightly bitter. So this impact, and there's more research coming out at a, at a spring meeting of the American uh, Chemo Reception Society, and uh, I'll, I'll be happy to report back to the committee because there's a few relevant uh, abstracts that are posted that may actually have some direct evidence that, that, it's, that it's more by smell than by taste, at least most volatile flavor components. All right, so although those are uh, sweet aromas rather than sweet tastes, you have rich interaction between these two systems so that sweet aromas can enhance the perception of sweet tastes uh, and vice versa. So you can have potentiation between these two things. And so, you know, we've found at least, and this is not universal uh, amongst, the, amongst the literature, that you have to have some sweet to potentiate sweet. Um, so what's always in there, propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin, and we're doing a little research looking at how esters, fruity esters and other compounds uh, in, in fact, the sweetness of propylene glycol vegetable glycerin mixtures. Those data quite, aren't quite ready for prime time, but so far it looks like we're getting some enhancing effects like, we, like, like we'd expect to see with sugars or non-nutritive sweeteners. Okay, one comment here. Again, these are universal, universally uh, used flavor compounds. 
So a concern here is that it smells like candy. Um, if it's sweet, it might taste like candy. Uh, so there's, there's an ingestion risk for young kids who might associate that flavor with, with, uh, with something good. Um, and you know, there's plenty of opportunity to learn those associations, but actually some of that learning might occur in utero. So my colleague at Monell, Julie Manella, found that, and, and others, uh, found that some of the flavors in the diet make it into the amniotic fluid, make it into the breast milk. Um, so that flavor learning and association might occur very on, and preferences build um, according to those exposures. No evidence that it's important here, but it's, it's at least reasonable. Okay, uh, last component, um, chemostesis, which basically just means chemical feel. When chemicals stimulate somatosensory nerves, you get um, positive sensations like cooling, all the way up to highly aversive sensations that we call roughly are, are kind of grouped under the term sensory irritation, like burning and stinging. Um, so menthol is cooling and pleasant. Uh, it's also burning and stinging at higher concentrations. Uh, nicotine probably has its biggest sensory impact through, through pain-sensitive nerves. Uh, also, cinnamaldehyde is a, is a potent agonist of, of, of receptors and, and, and pain-sensitive fibers. Um, so all those things are going on, and, and those are quite important. Um, there's also interactions. So uh, menthol, not only is it an irritant and a cooling, through, but through cooling pathways, it's an, anal it's an analgesic and an antitussive, and my lab has produced a couple of papers in line with that in humans. Um, that, 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 that that soothing effect is real and we can show it by ob objective behavioral measures like nasal irritation thresholds and cough reflex thresholds. Okay. So um, this could actually reduce a, a potential warning sign that could otherwise put people off of, of, of using nicotine. Uh, another paper um, that's come out recently, well this is a, a review of, of, of a few papers, even brief use of e-cigarettes desensitizes the cough reflex. Um, so and it's not just to nicotine. You can test people with the capsaicin, the, and that's the standard test of cough reflex sensitivity, uh, the, the principal irritant in, in hot chili peppers. So within 15 minutes of using an e-cigarette, your cough reflex is desensitized. It's reversible. You know, it comes back within 24 hours at least. Um, but you know, having a desensitized cough reflex in general, it's a vital airway defense mechanism. It's not necessarily a good thing um, for general health, but it also could make you know further and continued use of tobacco products uh, more tolerable. So I, just as a personal experience, I watch uh, some people I know vape, and they'll take these giant, giant drags and blow out these huge plumes. I tried a three milligram per milliliter tiny little puff, and I'd been over coughing, and that was it for me. Um, but a lot of them say that, yeah, you, you, you vape, and then you get used to it, and th this is probably part of it. Another concern, um, Julie Manella and I showed that children uh, who live in homes with, uh, that, where they're exposed to secondhand smoke have a desensitized cough reflex relative to children who live with never smokers. Um, if nicotine is the, is the active culprit, let me back up and, and add one thing. Some animal research suggests that this, that this desensitization by nicotine is not peripheral, it's central. Um, since in cats, for instance, you can eject the nicotine into the brain stem and you can get similar, similar effects. Um, so if this is a nicotine exposure effect, it would be nice to know if similar things are happening with, with, with kids exposed to, to vape um, or vapor. Um, no evidence that, that this is important in any way, but I find it tantalizing that a recent study showed that children exposed to uh, vapor uh, in the home, or sorry, cigarette smoke in the home are more likely to start vaping. Um, and that's independent of whether their parents smoke or not. If you control for, if you can, so it's, it's the secondhand smoke exposure that seems to be operative. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna move on to kind of laboratory sensory studies and ends all using basically subjective measures. And again, there are not many of them. Um, so uh, one study looked at commercial e-cigarettes, uh, blue sigillite products, 12 milligrams per milliliter, kind of an intermediate nicotine level. They used six flavors, classic tobacco, magnificent menthol, cherry crush, great names, pina colada, peach snops, and vivid vanilla. Um, don't know what's in these, um, but you, know, you can presume that there's a lot of menthol in the, in the menthol product and you know, fruity esters and some of the others and maybe some vanillin and ethyl vanillin. 
although a lot of these fruit flavors um, often have traces of, of, of the maltols and the, and the, the ethyl maltols. Okay. So they're adult vapors or dual use, abstinent for two hours before testing, and they, they vaped and rated sweetness, bitterness, coolness, harshness, and, and liking. Uh, so sweetness, so on this scale, um, this is a logarithmic plotted scale, so it's compressive at the top. Um, but these, these adjectives, are the, the labels are barely detectable, weak, moderate, strong, and very strong. Um, if it's plotted on a linear scale, it's, it's, these, are, these are empirically selected to give you a ratio measurement. So uh, a, a rating twice as high indicates um, a, a sensation twice as high as near as, as near as we can tell. So if you look at the kind of menthol and the sweet flavors, they give you a sweeter response. There it is. They give you a sweeter response from the tobacco. And again, this looks compressed, but this logarithmic scale, that's something like a five-fold, six-fold difference between the pina colada, which was the highest sweet rating in the, in the, in the uh, tobacco. Um, suppresses bitterness, and I didn't mention this before, but um, aromas can also suppress bitterness, although that's a, rest, a less robust finding than enhancement of sweetness. Um, so we don't know necessarily what's in these things. It could be a sweetener responsible for these effects. Could be aroma, could be some combination of, the, of, of, the, of, the, of both of them. But it's at least very consistent with what we, we would think uh, an increased palatability profile would look like. Um, coolness, um, it's a good sanity check. And it's always great if you're using subjective measures, especially with a complex stimulus, where you can ask people to rate a particular sensation, but you never can be 100% sure that, that, that that's exactly what they're rating. But nice sanity check in that you'd expect the menthol to have a, a high level of coolness, and it does. Uh, other other uh, compounds, not, not as cool. Um, so it looks like there might be some kind of trend in harshness for the, the classic tobacco relative to the flavored, pro excuse me, flavored products, but it didn't come out statistically significant. Um, so interesting, you do see some differences in liking. So the sweetest one was the pina colada, and it was significantly different from the least sweet one, which is the, the classic tobacco. Um, and if you look across flavors, there's some differences amongst the flavorants. But if you do correlational analysis, it, it looks like you know, sweetness tends to drive liking positively. Coolness tends to drive liking positively. Bitterness and harshness tend to drive liking negatively. Um, so it's all very consistent with what we know about flavor interactions in various products. Okay. So I mean, one drawback here is you're using these, these, these complex flavors, and you don't know what's in them. Um, so you, it's really hard to infer uh, the origin of specific effects. Um, so uh, another, uh, uh, another study, this one done by Barry Green at Yale, um, looked at the interaction between nicotine and menthol in e-cigarettes. And they used a standard uh, e-cigarette um, with blank cartridges and had manufactured uh, juices that were menthol at three concentrations by nic nicotine at five concentrations. Nice dose response built in there. Uh, and you know, propylene glycol, vegetable glycerin, and no other flavors. So it's a simpler system that you can really look at the interaction between menthol and nicotine. Um, adult smokers, most menthol smokers, abstinent 10 hours. Um, they rated cool, cold, irritation, harshness, and liking. And I wasn't able to get permission, so I'm sorry I can't send you a, send you a graph, so I'll just text it over. I'm sorry, that's less satisfying. Um, but cooling increase with menthol concentration, harshness increase with nicotine concentration, unsurprising expected dose response functions. But again, when you're dealing with subjective responses, any kind of data, but especially subjective responses, it's nice to see the data are stimulus locked. Okay. Um, the 5% lower menthol had no effect on harshness, but the 3.5% had a concentration dependent effect. So it increased harshness at low levels of nicotine it decreased harshness at high levels of nicotine. And this is at least somewhat consistent with the literature on nicotine and cigarettes. Um, so lower harm products or lower nicotine products, they often added extra nicotine to give it some throat impact or bite that it was missing otherwise. Um, also know that depending on concentration and, uh, of menthol and, uh, and uh, nicotine that you can see, you can see desensitization or, or uh, 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 rather reduction in perceived intensity, and, and we see this here. Okay. Uh, menthol tended to slightly increase liking independent of, menth of nicotine concentration, although liking for all of these things was pretty low. 
Um, so, you know, how significant that is, we don't know. So this is a one step away from a real product, um, but it has some real advantages in being able to look at um, interactions between specific uh, compounds. Okay, so I'm going to go over important methodological concerns. I um, was asked to, to do a little bit on that. Uh, basically, a good, a good experiment in sensory is like a good experiment in everything else. You want positive controls and negative controls. Although uh, some special concerns here, one is stimulus control. As far as I know, there's no available characterized e-cigarette um, that will give you metered doses. And metering of the dose is very important in sensory irritation because at least in the nose, we've shown that it works somewhat like a mass integrator, which means um, the total mass delivered is important. So time and concentration are, are both contribute to irritation potency. Um, so to do some of these sensory studies on irritation, really love I mean, a, careful, a carefully metered dose, uh, ideally controlling flow rate as well. But, but certainly um, knowing a little bit better about you know, what's, what's in the stimulus. Um, manage the condition of the nose. And this is, this is something that's you know, not universal to all sensory systems. The nose adapts with exposure uh, profoundly and pretty rapidly, uh, more so than taste, more so than chemical irritation. Um, so you really have to pay attention to the interval between trials, breaks, ventilation, uh, whether the people are wearing heavy perfumes or personal products, um, whether they've eaten or smoked or vaped before they come into a session. Um, so anyway, there's no hard and fast rule for how this is handled, but you want to see in the methods section that people are paying attention to it. Okay, so I've, I've already talked about um, sanity checks on subjective ratings. Another one that I didn't mention is you want to be able to give people a blank and they'll rate it a zero. So if you give people water, you don't want them to call it moderately sweet. Um, so again, if just, just seeing that people have paid attention to this is, is, is comforting. Um, so a, a last uh, note, due to the nature of the sensory stimuli, it's the sensory response itself we're often interested in. Blinding isn't always possible. Um, so you may have to get creative with your negative control. Like if you go back to the, the Kim study, um, I think of it as the Ju Yun Lim study because she's the sensory person involved, so she's the one I know. Um, they use the classic tobacco, which is not a sweet flavor, um, so that's a good comparison stimulus. You know, like in the past with odor, flavor, odor taste interaction studies, I've used like a burnt bitter aroma um, that shouldn't enhance sweetness to make sure that just any salient stimulus we give you know, doesn't have the effect. Um, so those are, those are kinds of uh, uh, basic general details to, to watch. Okay, so key needs for further research, and I, I have to uh, admit this is heavily character, you know, heavily colored by the fact that I'm a sensory geek. Um, but love to love to, but th this this goes beyond. But love to see some studies that combine sensory measures, including objective measures of airway irritation, to directly relate to vaping behavior and individual differences in, in response, in particular. So I've cited a study here that did collect at least subjective sensory responses and uh, looked at uh, you know, e-cigarette use over you know, days. Um, they didn't report the sensory data, so I, I don't know why she's giving a presentation on that in April, and we'll see, I'll hopefully see what she has to say. Um, by the way, if you're out there, I'm not criticizing you, I'm curious about the study. Uh, so studies in, studies in non-smokers and non-vapers. So obviously there's, there's some ethical problems here in exposing people to nicotine if they're not using nicotine. But if we want to know anything about the naive user and how they might respond to initial use, uh, we need to figure out some maybe abbreviated controlled ways to do this. Um, so the kind of thing that you might do is like a single inhalation cough challenge where you pick one concentration, have people huff it, and then count how many times they cough, instead of a more traditional challenge where you'd start from a low concentration and work your way up. I mean, that's not problematic with capsaicin, but obviously with nicotine it is. Um, so, uh, you know, and, uh, again, the cough reflex is desensitized. They've exposed themselves to a variety of, of flavors constantly. So, I mean, again, the, uh, the naive person is not going to have the same sensory perception as, as the experienced person. Um, okay, so uh, finally, studies on, on, on uh, effects of secondary exposure, and I've, I've done that. So time, do I have time to go through the conclusions? Okay, so uh, qualitative and survey research, and we've seen other uh, components that today suggest that flavor is important. Um, by several measures, e-cigs, uh, flavored e-cigs are more rewarding. 
Um, known ingredients can impart and or enhance positive sensations. Others can impart or ameliorate aversive sensations. Uh, and the few sensory, stu sensory studies and ends are broadly consistent with flavors modulating properties in ways that could be important for encouraging use. And uh, again, further studies uh, targeted would be helpful. All right, sorry for going 30 seconds over. Anyway, thanks. Okay.